Hallelujah. I want to read this to you so that you understand what was done was the imperfect till the perfect came. So what I'm about to tell you is a foreshadowing of what perfectly was shed for us on Calvary. But I gotta go back to what was done for you to understand what he did. So someone just kindly shared Hebrews 10, 1 to 4. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the corners thereon too perfect. It just wasn't possible for it to become perfect for the sacrifices. It was a foreshadowing of what was to come. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Scripture interprets scripture. So I want you to, to know something here today that what Christ did on the cross was perfect and encompasses both what the first goat and the second goat signified. Saints, you know why we're going to know these things? Because we feel a deliverance is come out in Jesus' name. Spirit of shame, go. Spirit of rejection, go. Listen to me. When you get what the word says, when you know the truth, it will set you free. Some of those demons, they will go on their own. And when we cast them out, there's no fight on. You understand what I'm saying? That's why it's not, it's, I, I feel that, sure, we, I, can, I can pray and say in Jesus' name, whatever is there, come out. Saints, they'll all come back. Because we haven't gotten what the word is saying. So the second goat, that second goat, For those of you who might not have heard me say this first part, because even though the debt was paid, the haunting memory of failure continued. The debt was gone with the first goat, but the shame continued. And there are those of you that know you are saved, but you're walking in shame. You're walking in rejection. You're walking in all kinds of things that you don't seem to be able to be set free of. But you've got to understand what the word says. And it will begin to be a sword in your soul. So some of those things will start to be cut away. You see, that first question, what must I do to be saved? We know if I believe that Jesus has died on the cross and he rose, I really believe that he rose bodily, not no spirit, that he shed his blood for me, that blood that was shed. There was a foreshadowing in the Old Testament of it. But once and for all, that blood was shed. On the cross, Jesus Christ was crucified in the most shameful way. And he died and rose bodily. When I believe that, not just in my head, but in my heart. There is something that happens. There's a conviction that comes that nobody could do. It's a work of the Spirit. And you know that you know your Redeemer lives. If it hasn't happened to you, it's not a prayer you say. The prayer is like you're kickstarting a car that's not starting to help you 
but there's something that happens for you know the Holy Spirit brings that conviction and you will know something has happened you don't have to be in church for it to happen there's some of you it didn't happen in church some maybe it happened in church some it happened outside where you were just walking along and the Holy Spirit just came and brought that conviction but you see there's a second question that must be answered because many of us is the deep hurts that's keeping us back it's the it's the deep betrayals it's the deep rejection is the deep shame the question is what must I do to be healed it's not enough for my guilt to be gone I must find a way for God to take away the haunting memory of all my repeated failures does somebody need an answer to that question or have you found yourself thinking these things I feel like I've just failed. I've just I've not raised my family right. I'm not a good enough wife. I was not good enough friend. I don't even think I'm a good enough child of God. Many of you are very quiet, but I need you to know that God would not have me preach this message if many of you were not struggling in this area. You see, you could be about to be evicted because you might be behind in your payments for rent. And at the last moment, someone comes and pays the rent for you. You're overjoyed. But at night, you're still thinking, why did I allow myself to get into that situation? You all catch where I'm going here today. It was paid and you're joyful, but it's like, why did I let myself get to that place? That's what we're talking about. That is the kind of thing that the devil brings that want to steal your joy because you know you're saved but Jesus is here today to say to you you have to understand what the second goat was for Jesus encompassed both you see Guilt consumes many of us. Even though we are not guilty of the thing, we still feel guilty. Your rent was paid. Somebody came and did something for you and you got out of the position, but you're still feeling guilty. Your self-perception hasn't changed. Your, the debt was paid but your thought life still going wrong and wrong in your mind at night and you're consumed with the memory of being a failure so you can't even enjoy the debt that was paid for you saints these are the things that keep us back we don't talk oh I saved I saved yes but because you haven't understood the purpose of that second goat that Jesus not only paid the price for you but you're going to understand now so as I said to you our legal standing might have changed but our self perception did not even though that debt was paid for us on Calvary our thought life is the same. It's like our minds are not renewed. We're going to sleep with all kinds of things coming to us. I'm not good enough. I'm this, I'm that. God loves other people more than he loves me. All these things. And we are consumed by thoughts of failure. God's people, just like all other people, God's people are supposed to know better. But if you do a survey, that all other people are struggling. And guess what? God's people struggling as well. With these thoughts, with these feelings of failure, with these deep hurts, with rejection. It seemed as if it wasn't enough 
with the first goat, the blood being spilt. And in our case, the blood of Jesus Christ was shed on Calvary. Not only to pay the debt of sin for us, but to heal us of these things. So it didn't seem as if it was enough just to be forgiven of, 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 of our debt. We needed to resolve our inward feelings of guilt. And in the Old Testament, this is exactly how it played out. They needed another goat. When we talk about the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, there were two goats. And one represented the blood that was shed for the sin. But there was another goat that was needed to resolve the guilt of the people to bear their shame. So most believers know that they have received the gift of Jesus Christ, of Nazareth, of Yeshua, of the blood that was shed as payment for their sins. But don't remember or know that they have also received in that Jesus Christ, Yeshua, as the bearer of their shame. And this is what we need to understand in a little bit more depth. He also bore our shame. Remember I told you that second goat, the priest spoke all the iniquity, all the failures, all the sins, everything over the goat and sent it into the wilderness. The foreshadowing, it's so clear when you understand what the Old Testament says and the, the, the way the, the, the Jews celebrated those things, those feasts. Many of us, we don't even know the Old Testament. But it becomes easier to understand just what Christ did for us. He bore the shame. He became the scapegoat. He literally became the scapegoat. This explains why so many believers, though we know that Jesus Christ died for us, we still feel guilty. Could I just ask, how many of you at some time or another struggle with guilt? Whether it's guilt of something that you've done or something you don't know. You understand what I'm You know, you, you, you literally go before God and you ask him forgiveness and you cry out to him. And yet, in your mind, you still feel like, how could I have done X, Y, and Z? It explains why believers who would have been given the free gift of salvation are still trying to earn their way into heaven. And in many cases, trying to perform their way in the midst of believers, in ministry and otherwise. It's almost as if, yeah, I know Jesus died for me, and I know he forgave me, but if I could do all these other things too, that would alleviate this guilt that I'm still feeling. But I want you to understand there are different kinds of scapegoats that we experience in our life. And I'm coming to that in a moment. It explains why a person can be born again, bound for eternal glory, child of God, and be mean, mean, mean when it comes to others. Because that's what, not just their guilt, they look at others. Look at you, you old sinner. Balling you as a Christian. When they speak, you don't, you don't experience the love of, they love you and they know you're struggling. It's like, look at you, pretender. Be the big pretender. But you know they're convicted of sin. You know that they, their life changed. But they literally see the guilt of everybody else. 
That is one of the reasons why. There's an area of healing that they have not understood. Christ took the guilt of sin and the failures of all the people that they find sin in on the place still. I'm not here to condone sin. I'm here to tell you, if you come into church as the church, and all you could do is get cocky eye about all who still sinning and, and look at them, and, and, and don't know why they don't repent. That's what I'm talking about. They forgot. The scapegoat took it all. Pray for the people. It explains why we expose too much of our private lives to others because we kind of need to talk about everything about us because after all, if I could just talk about everything, they will understand why I'm actually not so good. Let me just explain it quick. Let me tell you all the failures because you've not understood. He took it all. He's the scapegoat that took it all. And those are the things that still have us trapped. You hearing me? You hearing me? He took it. He took it all for you. But I'm not finished yet. There are people scapegoats in our lives. There are scapegoats in the playground. When you were growing up. Some of us are putting myself in this too. Look at that one. I had some kind of glasses. My parents couldn't afford anything more than the cheapest one in the optician. And the cheapest one was the ugliest one. That's all they could have afforded. So when I went to school, those glasses... And I put them on my first day, my sister, to go to school. And everybody was laughing at me in the class. But it's all they could have afforded. These black things. That <laughs> yeah. Here's what. What they were saying is, look at her. Aside from, I had buck teeth, I didn't have braces, so you could understand what I look like. Look at how she's looking. We will put our shame on her. We're not as ugly and poor as she is. That's what people do when they make you a scapegoat. They, they don't, they haven't gotten it. Listen to me. If I knew what I knew now. He took it. He was my scapegoat. You understand? But I didn't know. So now I took the shame. I took the embarrassment. This is what keeps us back. Because nobody told us. Even if they didn't like my glasses. Even if they find I was ugly. I'm not your scapegoat. He is my scapegoat. He took it. He took it upon himself. He took it. And then their family scapegoats. They're scapegoats we come across in the family sometimes. Maybe it could be the middle child. The firstborn was perfect and the middle one given all the trouble. Maybe. I'm not here to talk about myself, but I'm not going to use nobody else. So if one was brilliant and the next one was like a turtle, you understand? <laughs> Always in trouble because I had an answer for everything. I was quick, draw my grow. You understand? If you told me A, I told you back B. I wasn't rude, but it's just like you understand what I'm saying. 
That made up for the turtle. That was. So what happens? True story, Olya. Yeah. If the family wasn't happy, is that one fault? You understand? Let's blame she. You understand? The problem is my parenting, you know, is that one. Every one of the others okay, but you see, she, she's the problem. No, it's not our marriage. Our marriage is not the problem. That child is the problem. If that child would just behave, life would be fine. I remember they told me, because I was a sensitive child. Now listen to me. I'm not, this is not because I have to tell you my life story. I'm trying to tell you why I love him so. Because he took my shame. They put shame on me, but I didn't know at the time. That he took my shame. So, anything that went wrong, moi was blamed, even as I got older. Oh, she married that one that looked like he had a future. Hmm. It wasn't how wonderful she got a man of God. It was... Hmm. She gonna know how to spend he money. True story, y'all. Do you understand? Nothing you did was right. Nothing was right. And when you grow up like that, you are made a scapegoat. When God says, I was made the scapegoat for you, do not accept being a scapegoat and if you were made a scapegoat it's time now for you to do as the priest did and go before God and all the things that they said about you and to you in the family they didn't know better begin to tell Jesus how grateful you are that he took the fact that they made you you were this, you were that there are people up there today when they see me they remember what my parents have said. You know, somebody said, if your own parents could ill speak you, something ought to be wrong with you. Those things are said. But Jesus knows the truth. Do you understand me? They are marriage scapegoats. Somebody must shame somebody after all. I can't be blamed for this marriage. So in a marriage, it's always going to be somebody's fault and whose ever mouth is bigger the other one it's their fault you're too fat you had these children and you're not looking like how you used to look making the spouse into a scapegoat and people believe these things sometimes I tell people I say boy God knows who he put who with you think after, after God showed me whose I am, you could ever come and tell me I fat and ugly? Listen to me. You could have do that to me before I knew the truth, but the truth has set me free. And these are the things. You have too many friends. These are some of the things. You don't have enough friends. You're always in church. You're only praying all the time. Scapegoat. Saints, look at the lie. Look at the agenda of Satan. See what it is. One spouse loses all the arguments and over time feels lower and lower and lower and lower. Until finally, you could write out a list and read it to them. You're this, you're that, the other, and they'll sit down and listen. Because you see, when you believe you're a scapegoat, when you allow people to make you into a scapegoat, after a while, if you don't know the truth, you will get into a cage where you will be like literally waiting for the list every morning. You're this, you're that, you're the other. You, 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 you should be glad that you have me in your life because I could redeem some of your qualities, but this goes on. 
in Christian marriages who have lost sight of loving as Jesus loves. Even a fist wouldn't get the scapegoat to move. They'll feel they deserve it. That's why there are women and men that stay in violent marriages. Well, I provoke them, so that is why. You've been made into a scapegoat and you forgot Jesus is your scapegoat. Put it all on him and do not accept what has been said to you. There are workplace scapegoats. Anxiety grows because time's uncertain. And you're hearing, well, you know you are last in, so you're first out. You're hearing the negativity. You know there's going to be a lot of layoffs. You're hearing sales are down, you know. You're lucky you have a job still. So you better put in some extra time. And don't come and ask me for time to go to Tarian because guess what? Put in the extra time. You're lucky to have a job. They're trying to make you into the scapegoat for the downturn of the economy. So you begin to be like fearful. You actually believe those things. That your extra hour going to turn the company around when the reality of it is the economy is what has caused and the COVID. Do you understand what I'm saying? If our sins are paid for by the first goat's blood, but our shame is unhealed, listen carefully, we'll always be looking for another goat. Follow me here. Wounded people will always wound people if they are not healed. Are you following me? If your shame is unhealed, you will do the same to others. You'll blame them for everything that's wrong with you. If something happened, it's never me, it's you, you will be looking for another goat. That's why ashamed people shame people. That's why we need Jesus Christ of Nazareth, not only to save us, but to heal us. Remember, when he shed his blood on Calvary, he encompassed the two goats, but many of us don't know about the second goat and the significance. It's not only paying the price for our debt, it's healing our soul, healing us in our brokenness, healing us in our imprisonment of discouragement and shame. Isaiah foretold it. Because we needed a savior, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer and to make his life a guilt offering. His was an offering for our guilt. So when you believe the lies of others and of Satan, your this, your that, nobody love you. You've got to remember, he didn't only shed his blood for you and pay the price. He didn't only pay the rent for the house. But everything to do with the house he dealt with so that you would not have to carry the load of any of the effects of your sin. Follow me carefully. Let me say it another way. We needed someone to bear our shame. He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, saints. So when the word says what the word says, even if you tell yourself you're not hearing, you're not feeling it, did you know it? 
You got to know the truth for the truth to set you free. So nobody could come and make you be a scapegoat unless you have forgotten that the mistakes you have made that you have repented of, someone else called Jesus has taken the shame and guilt of it. Some of us make ourselves a scapegoat because we have not understood just what he has done. I want you to understand that Christians have found religious words to make the transfer is words that really they're transferring shame to the person by using religious words. So they'll say things like, you know, you really need to be praying for Lazarine. <laughs> Did you hear that she had an affair? The way those words have been put across, they are already putting shame on Lazarine. Do you understand? I didn't have an affair. That's how the Pharisees were. We didn't sin. We don't sin, so you know. Do not let the religious make you into a scapegoat and don't use his church to make others into a scapegoat by religious language and soulish prayers. You see, there were hands that the priest laid on the goat's head. And people will attempt to put these things into your head. You might not be able to stop them from speaking. You might not be able to stop them from putting shame onto you. But here's what. You can choose to take what they have tried to put and go to Jesus and say, Lord, take it. You are my scapegoat. You have taken all of this. I have repented. Nobody could come and put these things. And let me tell you, they're bold to you and they're laying hands on you while they're praying. Do you understand what I'm saying? Father, help this one not to be so sinful. Father, I pray that your spirit would come down and you will help them to understand their need to stop sinning so much, Lord. Instead of praying, conviction of the Holy Spirit and the love of God to come and be upon this person. God know their sin. We put it upon them. Listen to me, saints. Here's what you do. Now that you know, a second goat was particularly used for all the guilt, all the failure, all the things that keeps us back. A second goat was used. When Jesus came, he encompasses paying the debt and healing us. See, a lot of us, we see the healing as only physical. There's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of pain within us. Take it and put it upon Jesus. He has borne our infirmities. He took them up and he carried our sorrows. Do you understand that? Holmes, you understand that? Well, I want you to not try to understand it because I myself can't understand it. I can't comprehend it, but it's so. No one is going to put anything on me and make me a scapegoat. 
We do it to each other. We do it to pastors. We do it in our families. Somebody has to get blamed for the way the family is. Somebody has to get blamed for the fact that your relationship is not right. So it had to be you to be blamed. Listen to me, saints. When you know whose you are, it's not that you are not aware that you, you, you have sinned and you want to repent. But don't let anybody rub your nose in it and turn around and tell you, that's why you're so. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. He makes me into his image and likeness. You have to learn what the word says and answer back with the word. Because when you hear yourself speaking those words, it will hit something in your heart. Because too many of us are walking around as the scapegoat in a wilderness. So we know we're saved. But we're not walking in healing and wholeness. I want to pause right now and I want to say to you that I want to pray for you. I want to say to you one of the reasons why we are being blocked from the love that God has for us. As I said to you all earlier, there was a small group that walked in here. And it's not that God loves them more than anybody else. But as they walked in and I felt the shift, I felt like a, a, a wind of, of, of love for these people that came from the Lord. I could barely remain standing. And I stopped and I said to them, you, you, you need to understand how much he loves you. If you cannot accept his love is because Satan has caged you as the scapegoat and you have to come out of that cage. It has nothing to do with feeling. It has to do with fact and truth. This is what he has done for us. So it's almost as if, as I said to that group, they will not feel what I said, but I felt it to the point where I could barely stand when I was saying it to them. You don't have to feel his love. You don't have to feel that actually he took your guilt and he took your failure. You have to choose to believe it because he said it. And eventually what will happen, the barriers in your heart, the walls that Satan has put in your soul, will begin to break. But you've got to choose truth before truth will set you free. It's not a feeling. So I want to pray for you right now. And I want you, that very simple message of the two goats. One, the blood was spilt to wash away sin, to pay the price. The other one, all the stuff that comes with our sin was put upon that goat and it was dismissed into the wilderness. Let us not walk around as Christians who know we're saved but don't know that we're also healed. The price was paid and he took upon himself all the other stuff. We need to acknowledge it and in time we will begin to experience it but you don't have to tell me this if somebody pays rent for your house and I'm going to use another example because as I studied that was the example that was used please don't read into it please I could use any example but I is the only one that we can understand somebody comes and pays rent and you're joyful but you're thinking about how it shouldn't have happened. You can walk around and no one will know that you are thinking how you messed up, how this could have happened or that. Because no, we're good at masking these things. We're good at masking these things. There are many of us walking around today. We're calling ourselves Christian. We know we are saved, but we're not healed of these deep things 
that are stealing our joy, that are stealing our victory, that are keeping us back from going to the next level because the devil is still taunting us with, look at you. You feel you're so good. You feel this. Look at you. You don't understand. You saw what you did yesterday. So, 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 that's what we're walking around with. Listen to me. You have to learn to answer back with the word. Jesus, my scapegoat, took it all. He took it all. He took it all. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for your people before we begin to close tonight. Oh God, Father, your word says, Oh God, that Psalm 139, 13 to 16 says, For you did form my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will confess and praise you for your fearful and wonderful and for the awful wonder of my birth. Wonderful are your works, and that my inner self knows right well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being formed in secret and intricately and curiously wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book all the days of my life were written before ever they took shape, when as yet there was none of them. How precious and weighty also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. This is truth. And you need to learn, as you speak these words, listen with your spirit. Don't listen with your emotions. Listen with your spirit, these words. In Jesus' mighty name, I declare that your Father has made you special. You are a special person created and crafted and designed by God, your Father. Before the foundation of the world, your Father in heaven planned for you. You are no accident. You did have to exist. And your Father, because he had purpose for you, willed you into existence. He chose your parents and wove you together in your mother's womb. Listen with your spirit, your spirit man. He planned your birth order and put you in your family. Your father gave you everything you need in the package of your life to be an overcomer, a victor, to take the negative parts of your heritage and triumph over them, to walk in the beauty of all God has placed within you. This is his word. This is what his word says. I call your spirit man to attention in the name of Jesus Christ of, of Nazareth. Listen with your spirit to God's promise in his word. Ephesians 2.10 For you and I, we are God's own handiwork recreated in Christ Jesus that we may do these good works which God predestined, he planned beforehand for us, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. He speaks to each of you today. Listen with your spirit. Your father has a purpose for you. I bless you with knowing that your purpose, as God has seen it in his heart. I bless you with being everything that God has designed you to be. Because as you experience the joy of fulfilling your purpose, you will benefit and others will benefit. And the world will be blessed. I bless you with fulfilling the call of God in your life and living out the fullness of his will. You are not a scapegoat. The scapegoat already took upon himself 
all those things that have been spoken over you by those who are still in bondage to being a scapegoat. I bless you with being in your father's time. Not running ahead and not lagging behind, but knowing his will and doing his will in the right time, the right place, the right way, with the right people alongside you. I bless you with fulfilling the call of God in your life and living out the fullness of his will. I bless you with knowing the things your father's called you to know and doing the things that he's called you to do. Listen with your spirit, not with your soul, not with your emotions. I bless you with being able to carry out God's work with honor, with peace, with joy, doing God's work God's way. Your father intends for you to be contagious with his joy. I bless you with being contagious with the joy of the Lord despite the challenges. The joy of the Lord will be contagious. I bless you with having so much of his joy that your joy touches everyone with whom you associate and you leave behind you a trail of joy everywhere you go. And when I say I bless you through the power of the Holy Spirit, it comes from him. Father, bless them with significantly introducing people to the genuine joy of life with God. Father, bless them that they can transfer the joy of the presence of God as others walk with them. They will draw from them the abundance of joy in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, bless them with companionship with those who know the joy of the Lord. That the joy of the Lord will stir up everything around them. Father, I call their spirit to attention in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Listen with your spirit to the word that God says to you. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Your father intends for you to rest at peace in him as he takes care of your enemies. He blesses you with an unafraid heart that will lead you to the place of peace where God will fight for you and you will not have to fight. You will watch God remove your enemies before your eyes and deliver you because that is what his word says. You will stand and move forward doing the things God has called you to do and he will fight your battles and wherever the enemy is seeking to block right now. Those yokes are breaking in Jesus' mighty name. Those yokes are breaking in Jesus' mighty name. I bless you with being led by the Spirit to respond to problems with faith, not as a slave out of a victim mindset of avoidance or blame shifting or overthinking. Father, bless them with perseverance not a spirit of fainting and wanting to give up. Father, bless them with embracing their problems, viewing them as challenges and as opportunities of faith, as new ways to see the many faces of God and how he will work in us through all these things to work out his plan for us. I bless you with seeing the presence of God in those things that the world calls problematic and painful, but you will see the work of God in the midst. In Jesus' mighty name, I bless you with such faith that you can rejoice in standing firm as danger gets closer and you see God intervene on your behalf in a supernatural way. Listen with your spirit, man. I call your spirit to attention. Every spirit man here in each person. Listen with your spirit to the word of God for you. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you received the spirit of sonship. And by him 
we cry, Abba, Father. I bless you with the spirit of sonship and the mindset of sonship. I bless you with embracing problems, with the confidence that God is in them to give you grace to solve them and to overcome. I bless you with a deep heart identity. You'll feel it deep in your heart. You will know as you are God's own very child, securely loved in his family, calling him Abba. And if you don't feel it, that's okay. His word says it. You listen with your spirit. I bless you with a settled assurance that he has a future and a hope for you. That he has written your days in his book with love for your best interests and his ultimate glory. I bless you with a spirit of sonship that does not make you a slave to fear because you know your father's with you. I bless you with being filled with a deep knowledge that your Abba knows what you need and has all the resources of the universe to meet that need. I bless you with delighting in the obedience of the fear of the Lord. I bless you with confidence that you have the riches of your Father and that you lack nothing and that you need emotionally, physically, practically Mentally and spiritually, he provides. I bless you with your father, waking you up every morning to be taught by him personally. I bless you with a heart that does not re rebel or shrink away from what he puts before you. And the saints declare, Amen. Amen. Amen.